Good morning. When John tells you to clap for me again, don't do that, okay? Um, just because that is my heart and that I desire for God to be the center of my family and my work, don't let that make you think that we got it all figured out and that everything goes just the way you plan. Because I think it's just the opposite. I think God just says, well, let's take this step. Will you trust me here? How about this enormous God task? Will you trust me here? That's kind of uh, the reality. So pray for me. I have many enormous God tasks. <laughs> many. Um, as I sat through the Sunday school and as I sat out here listening, see, I knew what I was going to be sharing today, what God laid on my heart, but you guys didn't. And so what's really cool when you have that opportunity, it's really cool when you start seeing the songs that were selected, the sharing that takes place, the way the Spirit stirs someone's heart, and you're just like, dude... Nobody can tell me that God's not real. Nobody can tell me that the Spirit isn't alive and moving and, and has something He wants to share today. Amen? Um, normally when I give a message, I, I just spend a lot of time just praying and asking God to share with me what He wants me to speak to this congregation. But today I'm doing something different. And I'm sorry about that. But uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I, I stopped being a pastor. And, and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't an ugly stopping, it was just a stopping. But I was very frustrated, and I was very cynical about church and how we do church. And um, I just was crying out to God, and I just said, Man, Lord, show me what it means to be the body of Christ. Show me what it means to be your body. And that's, that was my prayer. And one of the things that kind of kicked it off, and I don't know if you guys remember, I did a message here um, about being a pin, being a bowling pin in an alley. Well, that was the beginning of this long journey. And I just recently finished putting it all in a book. And it's about a 16-chapter layout of God showing me, me his body and, and, okay, what does it look like? How would I do that? How do I put that into place? And, and the struggle is, is that I'm not going to stand or sit in front of you this morning and say, oh, man, God showed me it and I got it all figured out. No, the more that God reveals, the less I feel like I'm, I'm accomplishing it or I'm even understanding it. Does that make sense? The more that God opens my eyes to what he really is wanting, and the, the more I feel like, oh, <laughs> I, I have no clue what I'm doing. So anyway, I am going to summarize this morning, as best I can, what God has kind of shaped in me moving forward, trying to be a disciple of His, a follower of His, trying to walk in the journey of being His body here on earth. Uh, let's pray before we start. Father God, I just pray that you've put words in my heart, you've given me scripture to share, and Father, I pray that uh, if any of these are from me, that, uh, that everyone here would forget them. And Father, whatever is from you, whatever you would have to touch each person's heart, Father, I pray that those will be embedded, Father, deep into the heart and the soul and that your spirit will, will rekindle those at times so that they can expound and grow and, and, uh, and build your kingdom here on earth. We just ask that in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. My, uh, both of my grandparents, grandfathers were awesome men of God. Um, but I'm going to share a little bit of a story with one of them. Uh, my dad's father, Jacob, Jake Berkey, uh, every time that I would go to see him, every time. I mean, it didn't matter. You know, he passed away when I was, I don't know, how old was I, 20-something? Uh, but every time I would see him, some point in the discussion, he would say, Chris, always be a good boy, and you'll never be sorry. He says, don't drink, don't chew, don't smoke, and you'll never be sorry. It's what he always said to me, every time. You know, and, you know, when you're a teenager, boy, you're just like, yeah, all right, you know, you know. But, but that always stuck with me, okay? Well, this week I read a story, and I was reading through the book of Jeremiah, and I'm not going to go into a bunch of details, but, 
But Jeremiah was this prophet that was warning the people to turn around and repent because, you know, if they don't, if they don't, the Babylonians were coming and going to wipe them out because God was sick of them. God was sick of their disobedience. And so one of the things that God always did with the prophets is he'd give, he would have them do stuff to be an example for the people. Well, he called Jeremiah and he said, listen, I want you to go to the Rechabites, okay? And these were a, a family of, uh, uh, well, what was his name? Let me look here real quick. Let me open this up so I don't mess it up. They were the son of Rechab, R-E-K-A-B. So they were the, called the Rechabites, okay? And what he did is he had, so he had set them in a room. All of, their, all of his ancestors came into the room, or not his ancestors, but his offspring or whatever, come into a room, and he says, set big bowls of wine in front of them and put cups in front of them. And then, Jeremiah, I want you to tell them to drink all they want. Okay? Now, that wouldn't be very good for my grandpa, would it? But no. Um, but you know what they did? This is what they said. We do not drink wine because our forefather, Jehonabad, son of Rechab, gave us this command. Neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. And so here they were called in by Jeremiah, and they were sitting there, and they were given all this bowls full of wine, and somebody a long time ago, one of their ancestors, told them, you and all of your descendants should never drink wine. And here, all of their offspring were obeying that command. Okay? And so here's God's response. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord. Jehonabad, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine, and this command has been kept. To this day they have not drunk any wine, because they obey their forefathers' command. But I have spoken to you again and again, and I will add again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again I sent you my servants and the prophets to you. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I have given you and you and your ancestors. But you have not paid attention or listen to me. The descendants of Jehonabad, son of Rechab, have carried out the command of their forefather gave them, but these people have not obeyed me. So why am I sharing that story with you? I'm sharing that story with you because our Father in heaven desires us to obey him. That is his heart. He, he wants us to obey Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to listen to His commands and follow them. Jesus Himself says that if you love me, you'll obey my commands. You'll obey my teachings. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not easy to do, is it? In fact, it's impossible for me as a mere mortal, a mere man, to do that. None of us have the ability to obey God's commands. So I'm going to set the stage for you, okay? And this is found in Matthew 16. You don't have to turn there. We're going to just kind of walk through it. But Jesus is having a little conference with his guys, okay? And he says to them, he says, who do people say I am? And some of them said this, and some of them said that, and some of them said this, and some of them said that. But then he said to Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter, one of his disciples, said, well, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. That's what Messiah means. It means Christ. It means the anointed one. That's who you are. And Jesus comes right back and says, Peter, you are right in saying so. And you, Peter, are going to be my rock. You're going to be the rock in which I build my church on. How cool is that? Huh? And so right after that, Jesus goes on a little bit more and starts to tell a little bit about what's going to happen to him. That he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested, and on the third day he's going to be killed. Well, old Rock Peter, 
feeling pretty good about himself. He says, no way, Lord, ain't happening, ever. Almost like gets in his face. And he says, I am not going to let that happen. And Jesus, in an instant, turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the thoughts of God. But you have in mind the thoughts of man. That happens every time I talk. Trust me. (laughs) Jesus is going to build his body on us. Through us. But he emphatically told Peter, and he tells us, that it's not about us. The three most dangerous words in the whole human language are, what about me? We can't think those words, we can't say those words. It's not about me. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus said. You don't have in mind the things of my God, of our Father, but you have the things of you in mind. Get behind me. We're going to have two focus verses this morning, okay? One at the beginning and one at the end. And these words are going to, these these verses really summarize what I'm going to be talking about or what God's laid on my heart. The first one is found in Matthew 16, 24. And it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, a follower of mine, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Okay? First focus verse. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I walk with a lot of people. And there was a couple that I was walking with and meeting with periodically. And the gentleman one evening, just emphatically, almost, you know, it wasn't confrontational, but got in my face, he says, tell me why Jesus had to be baptized. Woo! Of course, I pulled out my little pastor Rolodex and answered that question. No, what do you ask? How do you answer that question? Okay. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? Okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a good, valid question, isn't it? Okay, so I don't mess it up. I'm going to... This is, uh, this is in one chapter of what I wrote. And I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Okay? Not that this is right, but at least it's going to explain it better than I will off the cuff. Okay? And it starts with... Uh, Six verses out of Acts chapter 19. It says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when or after you believed? They answered, Well, no. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism, they replied. Well, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and languages and prophesied. Okay, so here's, here's my summary. I've often wondered about this passage. I mean, I know the significance of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is crucial in our walk. But I still question, why was it so important that the difference between John's baptism of repentance and Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit be mentioned this way? It wasn't until very recent in my thoughts about that passage that something very different jumped out at me. Jesus coming in the flesh and dying for us was his act of being our Messiah, the Christ, our Savior. In our baptism of water, repentance, we are surrendering the right of ourselves 
unto Jesus as our Savior. It is in this moment when we give up the right to ourselves to God through Christ, Jesus. Now see, this I understood. But what became much clearer in this passage was the baptism of Jesus' Holy Spirit. Jesus' resurrection, ascension, and mediation for us at the right hand of the Father begins Jesus' act of now being our Lord and King. My baptism of repentance is the emptying of myself. But my anointing is the refilling, the empowering, and the possession of Jesus in my life and submitting to Him as my Lord to whom I must choose to obey every day. You see, Jesus was fully man, was He not? No, He did not have the inherited fleshly sin because He was seed of God, not of man. But he still, being fully man, needed to be baptized by John. John says, no way, man, I'm not baptizing you. And Jesus says, no, this has to happen. This has to take place. Because Jesus, as a man, had to give up the right to his earthly life and surrender it to God. Amen? But at that very moment, when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, what happened? The Spirit of God, in the form of a dove, came and landed on him, did it not? And he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Because Jesus had to live a life of sin every day. A life without sin every day. And he had to do that in a fleshly body, didn't he? He was fully man, was he not? Yes, he was the Son of God, but he was fully man. And he had to be obedient to God every day. And Jesus Knew And God needed to pour His Holy Spirit on him. Amen? And what did God say as soon as that happened? This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. And Jesus became the firstborn. The firstborn of all believers. Of whom we now are brothers and sisters of. Amen? Amen? Jesus modeled surrender and submission to us when he walked on this earth. Being fully man, he had to receive the baptism of surrender, the baptism of repentance, the baptism of water, the emptying of himself, the need of God to save him from death. He then also needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit of his Father in order that he would be able to live and walk in submission. It is, it is the pattern that we are to follow. What is really awesome about the passage that I, I didn't read for you here, it talked about Jesus being in the order of the priest or the king of Salem, Melchizedek, that Jesus is now our Lord and our king and our priest who goes before the Father, who goes before God. You see, what we need to understand is that we have to give up the right to our life. That is a one-time surrender. But it doesn't stop there. We receive the Holy Spirit, and then every day, every moment of every day, we have to then submit To obeying the Spirit. But that's what the Spirit's there for. So that we can obey God's commands. Jesus is my Savior. Of whom saved me. Whom I surrendered my life to. But Jesus is also my Lord of whom I will submit to each and every day. Think about the first focus verse. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. That almost sounds like surrender, doesn't it? But it doesn't stop there, does it? It goes on a little bit further and it says, then they must take up their cross. Almost sounds like submitting. And follow me. Second theme or focus verse. And this is my theme verse. And every time I preach here I say this verse. And you probably are tired of it or you just don't remember. Which is fine either way. But Galatians 2.20 says. 
I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, what do you know? If we broke that down, it might sound a little bit like the first focus verse. Look at this. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. Sounds like a little bit like surrender. The life I live in this body now, I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Sounds like submission. You see, this world has three kinds of people in it. And that's it. Three kinds. There are no other kinds. Three kinds. There are no other kinds. Is everyone with me? This is going to help you as it helped me. There are people in this world that have not surrendered to Christ. There are people that have surrendered to Christ and not submitted. And there are people that are fumbling and bumbling along like you and I that have surrendered and are trying to submit to Christ every day. Three kinds. That's it. There's not alt left. There's not left. There's not right. There's, not le- there's none of this. There's not male, not female, not transgender. There's none of this. There is none of that. All of those are distractions that try to get us from having compassion on people. You see, we want to have compassion for those that have not surrendered their life to Christ. Amen? And so every day when we come across people that we are just like, wow, what is going on and what are you thinking? We have to have compassion. And there's a lot of people that acknowledge Jesus as their, Lord, their Savior, but they haven't quite gotten to that point where they're allowing Him to be Lord of their life. Amen? And there are days that I might fall back into that category. Amen? So how can we encourage those? And how can we you know, pray for them and, and lift them up? And then there's those of us that are just stumbling and fumbling every day. I don't know why I use that word all the time, but I do because it's tough submitting and being obedient while being surrendered. Amen? Bless you. I'm going to read a passage. I want you to get excited as I read this passage. You, know, you don't have to dance or anything like that, but just I want you to get excited because these are words that you need to be excited about. Because sometimes we're boring. Well, we are. Okay? Sometimes we're fearful and sometimes we're boring. You know, if you, if you and I would truly understand what has happened to us, what has we have been transformed with, I think we might look at things a little bit differently. Okay, listen up. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, where we were baptized into his death, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I don't see anybody getting real excited yet. A new life. Woohoo. A new life. You were, we were dead, and now we are able to live a new life. We surrendered, and we died to ourselves, right? You got me so far? I don't know if I made that very clear yet, but we were dead to ourselves. We surrender, and then we received the Holy Spirit, and we have been given a new life in Christ. Eternal life, Jesus said, is knowing the Father and knowing Jesus. Okay, that's what eternal life is. You are already, when you have submitted and surrendered, you are already in the midst of living your eternal life. Okay? Because you're knowing the Father and you're knowing Christ. What's going to happen, though, is at some point in time, you're going to be changed. You're either going to die in the flesh and then be given a new life, or Jesus is going to come back and it's going to be great and we're going to be transformed in the blink of an eye. And then we're going to live forever without all the other garbage going on in this world. Amen? Boy, howdy, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. 
Listen as it goes on here. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. <laughs> we, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. Praise the Lord. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Wow. I didn't write this. Now, if we died with Christ, we will believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin. Listen to this part. Once for all. That is even the crazy goofball people we watch on TV. It's even the people that haven't surrendered yet. Christ died once for all. I can't pronounce the guy's name that's in charge of North Korea, but Christ died for him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Does that sound like submission? It's surrender and submission. Christ submitted unto the Father. When he was in the garden praying tears of blood and tears of blood dripping from him, whatever, like sweat, I don't know how it was phrased. He said, God, will you take this big God task from me? But he says, not my will. Your will be done. And then he proceeded to be led to slaughter. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, surrendered, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, submitted. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that You obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. I I don't know about you, but I don't live my life that way very well. Okay, do you guys know the story of Lazarus? Jesus' friend? The one he cried about when he died. And he raised him from the dead. You know, Lazarus had a pretty good testimony, didn't he? (laughs) Dude, I was dead. (laughs) And now I'm alive. But you know what? His isn't any better than us. Because, you know, Lazarus was just raised to human life. We have been raised to eternal life. Amen? Amen? We have been saved from damnation, which is eternal separation from God. And it's going to be dark, and there's going to be pelts of fire, and there's going to be all kinds of nastiness. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like fun forever, does it? We have been spared. We have been brought from death to life. Man, are your juices flowing yet? So offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, obedience, for sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching in which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Paul says here, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. And holiness is nothing more than the definition of being set apart for God. Don't think you have to be perfect. It's being set apart by God, cleansed by Jesus' blood. 
And when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. This is a powerful verse, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I asked Jason to have us sing a song this morning, and we're going to all sing it together. And this is a pretty powerful song. And so I hope Romans 6 got your juices flowing, okay? Because I really want your juices to flow. Because what I want us to understand is, um, you see, when Jesus... He, I, I, let me read I, I better read it or I will mess up, okay? It's, it's in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and, and this is awesome. And this, is a, this is powerful. And Jesus says, okay, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He says, now I don't want you to leave Jerusalem, but I want you to wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You see, John baptized in, with water, in water. But in a few days, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, and said, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times, the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Kautz, and the ends of the earth. Okay, a witness is someone who gives his testimony about what he or she has seen or experienced, right? It's not somebody that walks around and tells people what they need to do. It's someone that gives testimony about what they have seen and what they have experienced and what they have heard. I'm a firm believer in the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves already have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we are suffer. And you see, John, that's where you, what you wrote down in Sunday school that I had mentioned about, that's where that comes from. I believe every one of us, we've gone through struggles. We're going through struggles right now. And sometimes we pray to God, it's like, God, why am I going through this? What is this all about? And I believe it's all there because, you see, there are this whole group of people that have not surrendered their life to Christ yet, haven't they? And how in the world are they going to see Jesus if they don't see it in us? God has chosen to allow us to go through whatever it might be in our life. And when we go through those things, sometimes we might not come out of them the way that we think we should. But in those things, can we be like setting up our Ebenezer stone, propping it up, and it says, this is how I've seen God thus far. This is how God has helped me thus far. You see, in this song that we're going to be singing, it's called Death Was Arrested. And I don't know if you know it or not, but it's a pretty awesome song. And, 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 and basically the song, the whole premise is, you see, it all started when Jesus saved us from death. Amen? We've been given a new life. I'm going to walk through the words with you. It says, alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. Now, mercy, definition, receiving, not receiving what we deserve, right? Not receiving what we deserve. 
your mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, I wish it said new life, okay? But my life began. Jesus took my death. Yes, I have to surrender the right to my life and give that to God. It's no longer I that live, but Christ Jesus that lives in me. Go ahead. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. I've become a child of God. Let's keep going. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began. You see, our testimony, our good news, the gospel, our good news that we need to be excited about and proclaiming is this whole thing that my, I've been given a new life. I was dead, and now I've, I'm alive. But I don't do a very good job of living that way. Because sometimes the weight of the world gets on my shoulders, and I think about how big it is, and I don't remember how big God is. Let's keep going. And this is just the chorus. Your grace is free. Grace is receiving something we don't deserve. It washes over me. Let's keep going. Keep going. Do the verses. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. That whole thing about being a slave to sin. Keep going. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Keep going. This is a powerful part here. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. Are you pumped up yet? (laughs) You know, I need to pump myself up sometimes, you know, pump you up. But man, this is... Keep going. Is that the last verse? All right. We're going to sing this song. And uh, I just want to tell you how much... um, My family loves you. You know, I have such a unique opportunity to be a part of so many different congregations in this community. And uh, that has been awesome because I believe God wants those walls to be tore down. It's not about us and them. It's about us and Him. And uh, I appreciate, Jason, what you and and the whole church is doing with you and I. And uh, my heart goes out for that and uh, what you guys are doing with the youth group. But I just want to tell you right now, there's only three kinds of people in this world. There are those that have not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. And there's a bunch of them. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then there's a lot of people that have surrendered their life to Christ, but yet haven't started submitting. And then there's all of us stumbling and bumbling through, trying to somehow surrender and submit every day. But don't you forget that you are a witness and that you have a real God in this real world and a real Jesus that saved you from death and gave you new life. And he has helped you in so many different things in your life. We don't have enough time or enough paper to write it down, do we? And that is our story. And that is our testimony. And that is what we need to be propping up in our lives for people to see, even the stuff that hurts and even the stuff that's ugly. Because it is in that that we are no longer a slave to death and sin. Jesus arrested that. He took care of that. And he raised us to new life. Let's stand as we sing. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, 
so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you you're in the slot it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new Father, I thank you that you've made us new. We have something to be fired up about, Father. We're just, we're just so grateful. Lord, we commit this week to you. We want to just walk in, in you this week. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed.